Dear church, let's talk preacher compensation. Hello, welcome to the Dear Church Podcast. I'm your host, Chris McCurley, joined by my friend, Jerry Barber. Jerry, thanks for being on with us today. Thank you. Look forward to our discussion. Yes, sir. I wanted to have you come on. You have years and years of experience in ministry. You've done interim ministry. You've done full-time ministry. You've written books and you have a podcast now. And uh, I feel like you are the best to talk about this subject with. I know there's others, but I feel confident that you can give us some good advice and wisdom on what to pay the preacher. The question that I get asked a lot from elderships, you know, uh, about where to start, uh, kind of what do you do, raises and, and, and cost of living and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so we're going to talk about that today. First of all, before we jump into our discussion, Jerry, tell us how you're doing. Tell us a little bit about the work that you have going on right now. Okay. Been preaching 63 years. August 18th, Gail and I have been married 60 years. Wow. Uh, we work with five congregations full time since uh, 2007. We work with 10 churches as an interim. Many people ask, What's an interim? Here's my elevator speech. <laughs> Many times when a preacher stays a long time, the church doesn't like the next preacher. I volunteer to be the one they don't like. And during the <laughs> six to 18 months that we're able to stay with them, uh, they have time to grieve the loss of their last preacher and gain wisdom on selecting the next one. Yeah, that's great. I love the way you phrased that. And and I know that you've uh, done a great work there in the transitioning to a new preacher. Uh, as we talk about what to pay the preacher, um, I, I think we're getting to a good place. I mean, what I've noticed with other churches is that that old mentality that we saw in some places where, you know, you'd keep the preacher poor and, and all that. I, I, I think that's changing, isn't it? I mean, talk a little bit about the evolution of what to pay the preacher and how that's changed over the years. As I look at my years of full-time ministry, I started out with a church who had never had a full-time preacher I had never done full-time work, and so together we shared a lot of ignorance between us. <laughs> I was scared to talk about it. Uh, in my early years, I would not mention money. Uh, yeah. First time I was asked to preach for a place every Sunday, they said, what, what do you need? And I said, I've never talked about money, and I'm not going to start today. Yeah. Uh, I have changed that attitude. Since that time, I have been paid well. I'm not talking about rich, but we, we've had our needs and we've been able to provide for retirement and, and, uh, we've, we've been paid well. And so that's since 1969. I found that when I, when I start, when I learned what I need, I felt a responsibility for me and my family. Uh, and and I was able to talk about it. I find things have worked. I've never not gone to a church because of money. Yeah. So that's been my history. However, I had to overcome my fear. Uh, I went to my second full time work, and and they paid us. I thought we were just rolling in money. I'd gone from a hundred dollars a week to a hundred and fifty dollars a week and they furnished the house. First one I had to rent and do everything else. A year after I got there, they came in and said, Jerry, you've been here a year and we'd like to offer you a rate. I said, Oh no, no, no. We're doing fine. <laughs> and I turned it down. It just scared me. I was afraid people think I was preaching for money. Yeah. A month or two later they came in and said, Jerry, we have a problem. People are asking us if we'd given you a raise. We had to tell them no. We didn't tell them why. It would really help us if you'd let us give you a few more dollars. And I said, well, I really don't want to, but I want to help you. So that's the way I got my first raise. I permitted them to do it, and they treated me well. Yeah, so it sounds like you've had good experiences along the way. I yes. know that. Uh, I know that I have as well. Some not so much, and I've talked to other ministers about that and about compensation. And it seems to me that there's really two camps. There is the idea that the preacher is an expense or the idea that the preacher is an investment. And obviously one of those is better than the other. I think if you treat the preacher like he's an expense, then uh, that's exactly how he's going to feel. And that's, you know, pay is going to be commiserate to that. Uh, but if he's an investment, 
you're not so much worried about what church X down the road is paying. You're worried about keeping the guy you have because you love him. You want to take care of him. Talk a little bit about that whole dichotomy. Well, I question, will you pay the preacher enough to support himself and, and his family, or will you require his wife to work to supplement what he should be receiving? And so she has to get a job to supplement his salary and to get insurance. And my observation has been when churches take that, they get a bad deal. Yeah. Because the wife goes to work to support her husband and get the insurance and then on holidays and days off and snow days, the preacher ends up taking care of the kids and they're paying a lot for him to be his old babysitter. Uh, yeah. So I think we need to we need to figure out a way. I'm not saying it's wrong for a wife to work. It certainly isn't. But we should not depend on her to supplement his pay. Yeah, I totally agree with that. What about uh, what about pay as it relates to showing your preacher that we care about you, we want you here? It, it's not always about the, the, the amount, right? I mean, uh, I've always said that, you know, Getting a raise is nice. The extra money is nice. But more than anything, it shows me that you want me here and that you that you support me and that you love me, right? Doesn't it say more than just dollars? Larry Burkett, who taught scriptural money management, one well, of the fir- first people I met, he preceded Dave Ramsey. Dave learned a lot from him. Larry was in Georgia. He said money is an outside indication of what's going on on the inside. Yeah. And, and that's always been that communication. Talk a little bit about the criteria that an eldership or church should consider when paying a preacher. I mean, what what goes into that? Because I, I, I've talked to many elderships that have have said, you know, we we don't know what the going rate is. We've studied it. We've we've looked at, you know, ACU does uh, the Cyber Institute. Yeah. They they put out surveys talking about compensation, among other things, and other churches um, have kind of looked at that to try to determine for the size of church that we have, what's the uh, what's the norm, all those kind of things. So when you're looking at the criteria for what to pay a preacher, what, what goes into that? Well, I think it starts before you hire. I get a lot of calls about hiring preachers. I got a call from a friend a few years ago. He said, I've helped start a church in Georgia. They've hired three lazy preachers in a row. Can you help them find a preacher who's not lazy? I said, no, I don't think I can help them. He said, why not? I said, it's not a preacher problem. It's a hiring problem. Those preachers didn't get lazy when they crossed the Georgia state line. So I think elders need to know how does he manage money before he becomes a preacher there. Is he a good steward of what he's paid? Does he live on a budget? Does he pay his bills? And you can find that out during the, the prospecting time. Oh, uh, yeah. You, you do background checks. You do a credit check. You can't pay some people enough money to provide everything they want need because you won't ever, they won't ever get enough. And then secondly, what's he worth? How does he prepare and present God's word? How does he relate to people? Will he show up for appointments on time? Will he set a good example as a husband, father, citizen of the community? And how much will you pay a preacher not to do certain things, such as throw angry fits and embarrass the church on Facebook and Twitter posts? Uh, And then another question is, what is comparable compensation for people in the congregation who have the education, experience, and effectiveness that you want your preacher to have? So that's some of the things that comes to my mind. One of the things things I encourage elderships to do when they they narrow down somebody that seems like he's the right man for the job is to bring to the table his job description and their ideal job description and negotiate. And I think when you get ready to talk about money, that's another good thing. You make an offer, and then you say, I had a church one time, one of the finest churches I ever worked for. No. Uh, they offered me something that was just low, 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 and I turned them down. And I said, you know, while we were there, we went to a grocery store and bought a little gasoline. It seems like 
bread and eggs and gasoline cost about the same thing as they do here. And you're way below uh, churches of your size. So they said, would you come back and talk? I said, yeah. And so I came with a budget that time. And I went down the budget and I said, here's what I pay for groceries. Here's what I pay to keep me in a car. Well, every item. And I said, I need one of two things. I either need that much money or tell me where I can buy it cheap. I'll be happy with either one. And we came yeah. to agreement. And then some things we'll talk about a little later on. We didn't have to talk about it again. I was there over a decade. Yeah, that's kind of that whole mentality that, and I've I've been encouraged to do this when I was a younger preacher, is drive your stake in the ground. Uh, Get it on the front end because it's harder to get it on the back end, if you know what I mean. And so it sounds like what you're saying is go into it with a real number of what you need and obviously within reason, right? right? And 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 say this is this is what I'm gonna to need to live and, and to you know cover my my needs and uh and start there um rather than just leaving it open ended and allowing them to decide because I've 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 had preachers come to me and tell me, you know, I feel like they're lowballing me and, and I do think that happens at times, uh that that elderships try to get the maximum for the minimum. Um because, you know, maybe they're it they're money conscious, maybe because they, they want to be good stewards, but at the same time, um, you know, trying to get them on the cheap rather than saying, you know, it, this guy's good and it's going to cost us, but we think he's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. You need to talk about I, Somebody put it this way one time, put all your bags in one asket. <laughs> <laughs> so, I love that. And, and when I went to this church, it was the first time in the history of the world that I was going to be able to get a house. My dad had encouraged me to do that. And so we negotiated that on the front end. Uh-oh. And so I had my house payment and all the other things. And uh, it was very, very reasonable. Yeah. But they paid me and we were happy and didn't have to talk about it again. Well, let me take that back. Just because you have something in the contract doesn't mean that people will remember. That's the reason we need written agreements. I've come to the conclusion all the people who don't need a written agreement are people who are never going to die and who are never going to forget anything, and they need to be working with people who will never die and never forget anything. Otherwise, you better write it down. After my first year at that church where I had these clauses in the, in the contract, they gave me a cost of living increase, but no merit raise. Yep. And so I went in and I said, you know, I, re- I really appreciate the merit raise. And I realized that I don't, des- I appreciate the cost of living increase. And I realized that I don't deserve a merit raise because if I had, you would have given it to me. Mm. Now, I realized that for several months, we've been baptizing a person every week. And the contribution is up a thousand dollars, but I know that's not good enough. So, what do we? What can I do that would help us to to have a merit raise? And the elder I talked to came back a day later and said, "You know, we've discussed that, and we're going to give you a merit raise." And so that was the end of our discussion for the next decade. Good. Yeah, I like that. I like the way you presented that. Doesn't this kind of come down to um, a bigger picture, an overall picture of how? Uh, the eldership and the preacher, the minister or ministers view themselves. And I've always said that, you know, this is a covenant partnership that we can look at this like a boss employee relationship. And in some ways that would be very true, right? Uh, you know, I, I've heard ministers say, well, I don't work for the eldership. I work for God. Well, God doesn't sign your check. So, I mean, right. you do work for the eldership and technically speaking, the buck stops with them. And so they are your bosses, but I've also noticed that when it functions like a boss employee relationship, it doesn't function as well as if it was more of a covenant partnership where they're your elders, but you're their preacher and you're in this together. This is a synergy, a team kind of thing. And so therefore we're both striving to make this the best that it can be. And compensation obviously is a part of that. Yes. And, and I want to be on the team or I don't want to play. Yeah. I've, I've, I've talked with some elderships who say, well, we don't meet with the preacher. And I said, well, that's fine. You need to find somebody else. 
if, if we if if after 60 years of preaching, if I can't contribute an idea, I don't need to vote, but I need to have my say. Yeah. In every as- aspect. Yes, totally agree, because this affects you as much as it affects them. Yes. For sure. Um, talk a little bit about some other ways that we can compensate the preacher, not just monetarily. So, you know, retirement, uh, health insurance. Um, I know of some churches that give a, a stipend for continuing education or books or things of that nature, even some that give a stipend for clothing, you know, for what to wear on Sunday morning. Talk a little bit about that. And also uh, talk a little bit about the idea where, you know, some things are outdated now, like the uh, the church house used yes. to be, uh, parsonage used to be a really good benefit, whereas not so much now with the housing allowance the way it is. Uh, that's not so much of a benefit. And so how we've got to recalibrate and rethink some things as far as compensation goes. Okay. I think adequate time to spend, uh, adequate time I'll spend with your family. In 63 years, I've never taken a spontaneous weekend to go see mom and daddy for Mother's Day or Father's Day. I understand that. I have so many weeks off and I can decide what I want to, but you know, I notice a lot of elders and deacons and normal people. Uh, oh, we just ran up to see Dad for Father's Day. Just happened to take the weekend off. Well, that's great. So I need that. And the more I've preached, the more people have been generous with that. Yeah. Uh, time for planning, continuing education, lectureships. The best gift I was ever given was a sabbatical in the summer of 2000. There's a long story there, and I won't go into how that developed, but it was great. I was off June, July, and August. Wow. Uh, we, we, my mother and daddy had been begging us, let's go out west. We went out a few years ago. We'd like for you to go with us. And we went out there and had a wonderful time. We visited 38 different. The way I presented it, they initiated. They said, Jerry, what can we do to encourage you other than give you more money? We're going to give you Cost of living increase. What can we do? Think about it. We're going to give your evaluation in a couple of weeks. So I said, in a couple of years, I will have been here seven years. I don't know about you, but I get tired of hearing the same preacher week after week after week. I'd like to have some time off and listen to some other people travel, do some other things. In two years, I would like to have three months off. And uh, I said, okay, we'll think about it. Next year, they brought it up again. You still think about having a sabbatical uh, next year? And I said, yeah. They said, could you give us some reading material? I did. They came back and said, okay, we're going to announce that in January. And that's the best gift I've ever been given. 38 congregations, took a week off in isolation, did special study, fasted, just great. That's awesome. Health insurance. I find there's a book, scripture, and verse to that. As you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law of the prophets. How would you like to be treated? Yeah. Now, where you get into a wrinkle is sometimes with farmers and truck drivers who run their own trucks. And they said, nobody gives me anything like that. In fact, I missed probably at church one time when I, Put those two clauses in contract expectations. And it was a downtime in the economy. And well, at all the small trucking companies, so I don't get guarantees like that. Yeah. So, but to me, that's that's the way you do it. Yeah. Uh, retirement. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Sorry. What I, what I tell churches to do. Uh-oh. And I've had an opportunity to consult with 10 churches in the last 17 years. When you get ready to make an offer, you offer your preacher a retirement plan with a matching amount that if he turns it down, he doesn't have enough sense to preach for you. Yeah. Uh, if if he said, no, nah, I'm not going to worry about that. Well, <clears throat> it's time. Compound interest works a lot better when you start young than when you wait two years for retirement. So I think that needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. What What would you say to 
maybe an elder who's listening to this and says, you know, well, we're at a church of, you know, 50 people. There's no way that we can even touch the hem of the garment with some of this stuff you're talking about. Um, you know, what, what would you say to that person? Well, I guess the first thing that comes to mind, if you can't afford a preacher and to support him well, probably need to look for a bivocational person. Yeah. That'd be my recommendation. And, there, yeah. and there's some fellows who are doing a great job and have done it for decades who do a great job with that. And yeah. they may get to retirement through their, through their other occupation or whatever. But, but to keep people poor to where they can't afford to retire is, and, and, and one of the horrible things that happened more years ago when preachers opted out of Social Security. Horrible. Yeah. Absolutely horrible. And I have friends who did that. They never got around to taking out life insurance, health insurance, and making plans for retirement. They under, ended up in government housing with a wife sitting with some old people so they could go out to eat every week or two. It's yeah. just pitiful. And some preachers, I've enjoyed that. I've enjoyed the investment aspect of it. I took the Wall Street Journal for 20 years, didn't read every page, but I went through every issue. And I didn't want to. I had a church that wanted to manage man, and I said, no, give me the money and I'll take care of it. Yep. So I had other people who advised me, but it needs to be done. Yeah, totally agree. That's one of the things that I would tell younger preachers nowadays is pay yourself first and yep. do that early, uh, yep. very early on, because you get to my age and it starts to become more and more of a reality. And uh, you think about that, um, you know, how much further along I would be if I started earlier than I did. Um, yeah, but, but you don't you... Go ahead. Sorry. It took me a long time. I started a savings account, and I'd trade cars. And I said, well, if I took the $200 out of my savings account, how much would that lower my payment? Yeah. And if I like, said one day, if you don't start saving, you're not going to have anything. Yeah, and right. So uh, the realities hit me. At, not as early as it would have been good, but earlier enough to do what I need to do. Yeah. Jerry, do you, do you think that uh, – a lot of this boils down to being realistic, too, uh, as far as the church, understanding um, what what you are as a church family, what you have to offer. And uh, it, I'll describe it like this. I know of a church that, uh, you know, they've decided to stop hiring young men with a young family because um, they all stay about a couple of years maybe three or four, and they move on to something else. And they say, we're just a stepping stone church, so we're not going to do that anymore. We're just going to, uh, we're just going to hire a, a man who's close to retirement or in retirement, and that yeah. way we'll know his, we know he'll stay. And, you know, maybe I'm wrong in this, but I, I tend to think hire the best candidates you can and understand who you are. And it, maybe you are a stepping stone along the way, but maybe – embrace that and say, you know what, we're, we're going to be a help to these young preachers. And if they do leave us, then hopefully we gave them a really good start. Um, you know, talk a little bit about that. Is it is it about realistic expectations? Yeah, I think so. I tell churches, when you hire a 22-year-old preacher, you're going to get a 22-year-old preacher. Yeah. And you need to understand that when you hire Jerry Barber at 23, he is somebody who was scared to talk about money, turned out a raise, and did a lot of other dumb things. Uh, I, I'm, I'm preparing topics for my podcast, and what I want to tell is what I learned preaching at, uh, or what I learned working at Harbor Store, a grocery store in Central Tennessee, when I was 11 years old till I was 14. I did a lot yep. of dumb things. I put a package of rolls right in the bottom of a sack because it fit, and then I started putting the beans and peaches and stuff on top of it. They didn't treat me like an idiot. They treated me like somebody had never packed groceries before, and after that, didn't do it anymore. And I did other things like that. So these churches can do a great benefit to those preachers when they understand that. And that's the kind of elders I had in my second full-time work. They explained things to me when I goofed up and, and sometimes went in with tears of mistakes I'd made. They said, Jerry, that's okay. 
you've yeah. apologized and and man, I love those people. Yeah. Yeah, that's a place you know, making creating an environment where the person wants to stay, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I, well, I know yeah. of preachers that have stayed at a place of, you know, a smaller congregation, much smaller than offers that they had gotten to, you know, maybe uh, greatly increase their salary and double the population at that congregation that have turned it down because they love the environment they were in and they love their church family where they're at. Bigger wasn't always better, right? That's right. Yeah. Jerry, tell us a little bit about your podcast that you're doing. Okay. It's called Gleaning Mustard Seeds with Jerry Barber. The first rule is try not to learn very much. And that will be <laughs> easy with me talking. And the podcast is only about 10 minutes. Okay. And so it discusses a variety of topics. Comes out at 1 o'clock every Monday morning. 1 o'clock morning, but you don't have to get up that early. It'll be there when you get up. Yeah. And uh, it's fun. I look forward to it. It's kind of like it just started a month ago and like a child at Christmas. I look forward every morning to get up and see who's listening. Jerry, I know it's uh, not uh, it's not uh, polite to ask a woman how old she is, but I can ask you, right? How old are you now? 79. 79. Are you still running? Uh, I run. Uh, my ideal week is six miles on Monday. Five on Wednesday and ride my bicycle 28 miles on Friday. Goodness. And Are you still running barefoot? 50 degrees and above. Are you still running barefoot? Yes, 50 degrees and above. 49 degrees I put on shoes. <laughs> and if you'll listen to episode two of my podcast, it's one of the most interesting conversations I've ever had in my life. There was okay. a lady who called me to her her car and she asked me four questions. I was riding barefoot. Do you know where you're going? Are you lost? Does anybody know where you are? And do you need a ride? You talk about a good Samaritan and an interesting conversation. It's powerful. Yeah. She thought that you were maybe escaped the nursing home or something. Well, according to two police reports that came in, <laughs> uh, the first one said uh, complainant thinks he may have dementia. The second one says complainant thinks he may have run away from assisted living. There you go. Neither were true. You're just crazy. <laughs> yeah, my friend uh, Matt Hyatt sent me a T-shirt that said, I am okay. I am not lost. I own shoes. Please don't call 911. And so I wear that frequently when I'm running now. That's the Matthew Hyatt that we know and love, right? Yes. <laughs> Jerry, thank you so much for tuning in today and being with us. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Thank you. And I want to thank all of our listeners and viewers. If you have a question about today's episode, you can email me at chris.mccurley at rippleoflight.com. If you have a question specifically for Jerry, we'll forward it to him, and I'm sure he'd be uh, yes. more than willing to answer your question. Thanks again, Jerry. Thank you. Yeah, and thank everyone for tuning in. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Sincerely, Chris.